a lot of that was just my anxiety talking. It was just right. this piece of me thinking like, I have to remain in survival mode and I'm no longer just surviving. That's why I was overwhelming myself with so much work and moving so quickly and scaling so quickly. I don't, I don't have to work to survive anymore. It's like, okay, what can I do right now to really enjoy the space and the success that I've experienced? Exactly. And that's the point that I'm at in my life right now is like, I'm done continuously working for the next thing. It's like, why am I doing all of this? Why am I putting myself under this pressure when I can choose whether or not I'm doing this? or not I can choose how much work I am doing because I'm I no longer have a job telling me what to do I choose what to do like it was baffling to me when I realized I'm choosing what to do every day and every single day I'm still anxious and worried it made no sense get your water and give some wine I should have had some wine with exposure execution and consistency there is nothing you can't do just keep planting before we get into today's podcast episode, make sure you go to the responsiblehunger.com and download the free money management guide that I have created for you. Most of the time when people are starting their personal finance journey, they know that they want to do better with their money, but don't know exactly where to start. The money management guide is a great way for you to look at what you have going on right now and to take steps so you can get better. Like, I don't want you to get overwhelmed, like, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do this. No, I want you to have a seat, literally sit down, assess what you have going on, and the free money management guide that I created for you will do just that. So make sure you go to the responsiblehomeware.com or just click the description, um, or just click the link in the description box below and go get that. You'll also be on my email list where I'll send out different tips, gems, personal finance stuff business stuff, all of the responsible homegirl things. So make sure you click that link, download that free money management guide and get your personal finance journey started because baby, inflation, I'm feeling it. Hey y'all, thank you so much for tuning back into another episode on the Responsible Homegirl podcast. I am Kiani, of course, the Responsible Homegirl and this is a space that I have created so young adults can become financially responsible and wealth conscious. So the way that I do that is by one, sharing financial education with y'all, and then two, interviewing amazing entrepreneurs who are building their wealth through business. So if y'all have been rocking with me for a little minute, y'all know about my series called Think Like a Mogul, and it's essentially where I interview entrepreneurs who are either from South Carolina or live in South Carolina. But today we're making an exception to the rule, and after you listen to this episode, y'all are going to understand like why I'm making this exception because it's going to be real, real, real good. Okay. So today we have no other than Miss Precious on the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. Like we are dropping some gems, getting the wealth building going. So I'm super excited. But yes, I am Precious Price. Um, some people refer to me as Airbnb money. That's how many people know me. Right. <laughs> but yes, aside from that, um, I am a real estate entrepreneur and digital marketing consultant. Um, so I'm based out of Atlanta, Georgia. So not too far from North Carolina. Not too far for the excitement. <laughs> um, so I'm based out of Atlanta, originally from Chicago, Illinois. Um, and I've been here in Atlanta for the last Oh my goodness, it's been four years now, four years. Um, and I have had my hand within, I'd say lightly within real estate. Um, initially, when I came here to Atlanta, I was actually still working full time. And then also like, I guess, had managing and building my own brand. So um, my background is marketing and brand management. So everything prior to me kind of jumping into real estate was a lot of marketing. How do you really monetize your expertise online? And yeah. I was working for a digital marketing firm at the time too. So it was just last year that I officially went full time with my own work and I'm not working for nobody else. So it's been amazing. Period, sis. Like so much from that. <laughs> For one, I didn't even know like that you weren't a full-time entrepreneur already. So I feel like that just speaks to your level of work ethic and your consistency. Because when I tell y'all, Precious <laughs> shows up, she shows up. One thing that really gravitated me towards your brand um, when I first got introduced to Airbnb money was for one, how young you are. Like mm -hmm. 
I don't know. I think I came in contact with Airbnb money like maybe a year or two years ago. So how old were you at that time? A year ago. So I started Airbnb money like a year and a half ago. So a year ago, I would I had just turned 25. Wow. I started Airbnb money, like released the ebook, all of that. Yeah. So how young you were and the fact that you were showing up consistently dropping gems, like you are not on Instagram giving people like this cookie cutter stuff or even telling people all of this great stuff about Airbnb so they could buy your ebook or buy your course. Like, oh, you was giving us the real. So can you talk to me a little bit about why even start Airbnb money and how you kind of navigated um, that journey in the beginning of your process? Absolutely. So as mentioned, like prior to um, doing or jumping into real estate, I was doing like the marketing and branding. And I've always been somebody to heavily, 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 heavily document my journey and everything that I'm going through. So it's like as I was when I started, you know, public speaking, I would put those videos up. When I started doing Airbnb and started doing short term rentals, I would put those videos up and just naturally I would be sharing my experience, sharing my lessons learned on my own platform. It got to a point with Airbnb and because I started doing so much and I was scaling so quickly, um, I went from having my apartment to buying a house. And from that house, I went to building a tiny house. From there, I rented somebody else's house. So people were really seeing like how quickly I was scaling and how successful it was. And they were asking so many questions. And that's when I'm like, you know what? I think I can create a completely separate brand around this specifically in regards to Airbnb and show people how can they get started with short-term rentals all over, right? Not even just Airbnb, whether it's Furnished Finder, Booking.com, VRBO, or what have you, because this is everything that I was doing. So as I'm learning and I'm doing everything, I'm sharing my experience because I also noticed something else online with so many other people who were teaching Airbnb. And it was more so like, they were only showing the good stuff. And when I really got into it, And I really like started, you know, doing my thing, building my team, having my processes. I'm like, this is not as easy as they say it at all. Like, Chris, my head about to fall off my shoulders with everything going on. (laughs) Like, it was way too much. And that's when I also vowed to myself as well that I am going to not only just share you know, what I'm doing and the money that I'm making and really showing you this journey and this process. But I am also going to share a lot of my lessons learned and my failures too. Because like there have been so many bad decisions that I've made within this industry. And then even furthermore, it's like things that people don't even realize could happen to you being a business owner within this industry as well, or just choosing to list your space on Airbnb. Like we always hear about the crazy stories with Airbnb, but it never really hits home until somebody, you know, tells you that story. Cause we always get so far out, but it's like, it could happen to you too. So that was really the premise of Airbnb money is really showing people what is the real business right? Like real business, marketing, financials, communication, sales, those like foundational principles. What is the real business behind all of these numbers and these screenshots that people are showing? Ooh, exactly. Because them screenshots are not enough. It's not. And then on top of that, it's like, I just feel like we got to have a lot more discernment as a community. Those Mm -hmm. screenshots are not net. They're gross. And expenses are heavy in this industry. (laughs) Exactly. We gotta be smart. <laughs> and what I've learned when starting anything new, like the numbers look great. Even me and you, we've had a conversation outside of this about me wholesaling mobile homes. Mm-hmm. The numbers look very good, but baby, are you like willing to do the work that it comes to get that? Exactly. <laughs> you you want you want the money, you want the screenshots, you want, you know, like all of the money in your account that I have, but are you willing to go through everything I went through in order to get there? And yeah. a lot of people aren't like, and I think that speaks to another thing that you said at the beginning of like, I don't just give the cut and dry of like, okay, this is just how you get started. And then you got to go buy this. I'm giving it all to you. And I tell people this, like a lot of people ask me like, you giving everything away. Why do you do that? Why do, well, number one, I understand marketing. There's tears to everything. Yeah. But number two, I could give it all to you today. I could literally give it all to all of you today and only 1% of you are actually going to go ahead and implement what I'm telling you and actually put action behind what I'm saying. So I could give it all to you, but only a handful of people are actually going to do something with that information. 
Exactly, exactly. With inflation going crazy right now, it is very important that you learn how to manage the money that you work so hard for and budget well. Make sure that you make your budget a part of your lifestyle. I know that sometimes budgeting, we can kind of have our own little feelings about budgeting or we just simply don't do it or we don't consistently do it. Well, lifestyle budgeting is going to tackle all of those mindsets, all of those things that are stopping you from developing a lifestyle of budgeting. If you want your personal finances to do something different, if you want them to look different, you have to do something different. And the basics is budgeting. Make sure you click the link down below and download the 2022 edition of Lifestyle Budgeting. Let's get right back into the podcast episode. One thing that stood out to me when you were talking about just what you share and why you share more than just, you know, just the ups and the numbers I feel like sharing all of that stuff, it gives people kind of like a peek inside of the process to even see if Airbnb is something that they want to do or short-term rentals is something that they want to do. Do you feel like having rental property, doing Airbnb is for everybody? Absolutely not. No. Some people just ain't got, just like they just don't have it in them. And for me, like I have a framework in terms of what I teach people when they come into my coaching program, mentorship calls, consultations. You got to have the industry knowledge. You got to have the capital and you have to have the business acumen. If you're lacking one of those, some part of the business is going to fail or you just won't even be able to get started. There are a lot of people who sit here and they tell me, it's like, okay, well, you know, I got the capital to get started. Like I got, you know, my own credit, my credit's in a good place. I got the cash to get started. Started, but you have no business acumen in terms of how marketing and sales and communication really integrates into this business. You think because, you know, probably somebody else on the internet told you that all you got to do is put up the listing and you hit list and publish and boom, you pay, you got $10,000 a month. And it's a lot more that goes into that. And if you're not somebody, especially at the beginning, who I guess has the flexibility to really learn the process and learn the business, then no, it's not something like it might be something that you can do for a couple of months. But at some point, it is going to get old because, again, it's just you didn't understand everything that was required to go into it. You found out and now you're realizing it's not for you. Wow. So I know that you just didn't wake up and you, you know, kind of knew all of this stuff. You had to go through a process. Yeah. So can you talk to me about the beginning of your journey? What even inspired you to say, oh, I want to do Airbnb? Yes. What inspired me to say I wanted to do Airbnb? Um, Super Bowl. Super Bowl had come to Atlanta uh, February 2019. It was a little less than a year, about six months after I had moved to Atlanta. And a lot of the friends that I had made here, the ones who had an apartment, had a house, whatever, they were like, I'm going to put my apartment on Airbnb. Like, I'm going to put my house on Airbnb. I'm like... Maybe I should too. Let me let me see what it's talking about. Right. <laughs> me too. Um, I put it on there, and at that point, it was just like, okay, cool. This is something that could work. Like I made my rent. I'm wow. probably like a weekend, maybe a week. Especially since it's Super Bowl, you can definitely like charge a lot more. So it, I very quickly made my rent, and I'm like, all right, I think I'm gonna keep doing this. The only issue was is when I started out, I was actually doing it like the way that a lot of people tend to think is the only way they can get started, which is under the radar. And granted, that's all I knew at the time as well until I started to do more research and until I received that warning letter on my door, like you're not supposed to be doing this. <laughs> Right. So when I started, like when I received that letter, I then started to do a little more research in terms of, okay, how can I really find out how to do this the right way? How can I find out how to do this legally to where I'm not putting myself, you know, in jeopardy of getting evicted of whatever. Um, So starting out, like I said, I started because of the Super Bowl, but even prior to the Super Bowl, um, I had like listed my space here and there like for a weekend, maybe once or twice, not much. Um, because at that time, a lot of people, which I feel like a lot of people tend to still have this narrative in their head is like, well, to do Airbnb, it's like, what, I got to let people in my house? Like, uh-uh, like I can't do that. Or I got to buy a house. I'm not buying no house right now. And before I really realized there are so many ways to get started, you don't have to just buy a house or let people into your space. That's when I was like, all right, I think I could do this. Um, so at the beginning, like I figured once I weighed all of my options, I'm like the best spot for me to really get started with this and really be- begin building a business with this 
is buying a house. Like I can do whatever I want to with my house. This is my space. I'm going to have way more room than my apartment. And in my mind, I'm like, all right, you know, if I make this much off of a one bedroom apartment, just imagine what I can make with a house. And I was right. It did really well. So about six months after the Super Bowl, um, I had closed on my first house because uh, I moved very quickly. <laughs> yeah. I moved very quickly. I started doing my research. I started touring places. Um, I started doing a tour of the city because, as mentioned, I just wasn't from Atlanta. So I didn't know where I wanted to buy. But I knew the number one thing was I didn't just want to buy where everybody else was. And I didn't just want to buy in the center of the city like a lot of people think that that is going to I guess provide them a way to quickly make their money back a way that you know they're not going to experience any vacancy or anything and that's just not the case because even when you think about here in Atlanta there's a ton of people doing Airbnb you can be right downtown and I, I do have clients who are right downtown you got a condo but because the whole building is Airbnbs you have a lot of competition that you're up against so you really haven't, again, this is where that marketing comes into play. It's like, all right, well, what makes your listing different? Who are you actually attracting? Who is your niche? So those are the, the types of concepts I started to really realize, like, everything that I was doing with branding and marketing, it translated perfectly yeah. into the business. <laughs> it translated absolutely perfectly. Um, and at that point, I was like, all right, I think I got something because... I realized, um, and I even like bought smaller courses here and there from other people. And I started to just do some comparison and realize that people aren't really teaching this. Like they're just telling you, go and get an apartment, get it in your personal name, fly under the radar, don't tell them anything. And then, you know, take that risk for what? Two, $3,000 per month from a unit. Yeah. I just personally didn't think it was worth it. So that's why I really came in with, I guess, the strategy that I did of actually showing people what's the real business that goes behind this and what is everything that I need in order to get started. Not just the cookie cutter stuff, not just some of it, but then you got to, I'm going to upsell you and I'm going to pay, you're going to have to pay for this. It's exactly. like, no, you get within the course, you get in the mentorship and I literally give you everything that I've done and all of the stories so that you know what not to do as well. Exactly. So I know you brushed across this, but I am not going to just let this fly. Sis said within six months, <sighs> you purchased your first home with the intention to do Airbnb. And yes. this is so crazy because I'm always telling my community to be intentional. Like literally your life can change in six months. Oh, it changed are so quickly. Right. Are you willing to write the vision down, make it plain and do the work it takes to get there? Mm -hmm. So can I just talk about your mindset at that time? Because this is 2019. Mm -hmm. And at the time you were 24, 25. I was 22, 22. Ooh. 22, y'all. <laughs> 22. Can we talk oh, about your <laughs> mindset to say, okay, I'm going to go buy a house. How am I, mm -hmm. I going to get this money to buy a house? Like, I just want to, I want you to take us back to that time. Okay, take us back. I'm gonna take y'all back to 2019 when I decided to purchase my first home. So 2019, like I said, that is when I started to do Airbnb. Um, and okay, I started to do Airbnb. Um, February 2019 is when the Super Bowl came to Atlanta. The Super Bowl had come to Atlanta. Um, and then at that point, like I said, very quickly after I closed on my house, October 16th, 2019, I would never forget the day. It was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but my mindset at the time was at that point, like I had already been in my corporate job and mind you, like I left or I walked away from a career, like it was a six figure career. Um, and again, I was, I was just 22. Like I came out of college making a very good amount of money. I went to business school. So I have a bachelor's and a master's degree, but I came out making very good money. And I knew, I always knew in my head, I'm like, I mean, I'll, I'll take a job here and there, but I don't want to work for nobody else. <laughs> like, no, I don't. I just don't see myself doing that. And I do have to attribute that whole thing. I would say to my mother, like, I have never, ever seen my mother work a job for somebody else. 
She has always had her own businesses, whether it was her in real estate, she used to do wholesaling out in Chicago, her and my dad, she would resell clothes. She then um, started a hair salon and went to cosmetology school. So there was a ton that she's always just been running. So seeing her, like she called the shots everywhere. Seeing her call the shots, it changed my mindset like very, very early on to like, I mean, I know I don't need a job. I just got to figure out which business I'm about to make pop. <laughs> right. That was my mindset. So um, that happened. And then, like I said, once I started to really make some money, like I had already been side hustling and I had a business outside of my career. So I used to do professional development, personal development. Like I said, really showing people how can they monetize the knowledge that they have in their head to create their own separate identity outside of what they have at their nine to five. Um, so my mindset was already there, like I would say initially in terms of, all right, what is the true identity that I want to create and how do I then want to go on and I want to build wealth because I am somebody that I am a first generation everything. Um, every single thing that you can imagine, like graduating high school, graduating college, getting a master's, all of that. Um, I'm first generation and my parents had me very young. So I've always had that mindset or at least that mindset was always instilled into me of like, all right, what can we do to make life easier and to get to the long money? And I learned in business school, I went to a predominantly white institution. Mm -hmm. I learned in business school from the information sessions they were having, the people they were bringing. I was huge on networking. Um, I learned from a lot of really successful people that one of those primary ways you're really going to be building wealth is through real estate. Interesting. And- that that is pretty much what had changed my mindset. So I'll be honest with you, like when I first moved to Atlanta, my mother immediately off bat, she told me to get a house. So I was supposed to have bought that house at 21, but yeah. I didn't because she like, she was pushing me and I'm like, oh, I don't really know the city. I want to, you know, have that, you know, like be young and in an apartment. That's I want that lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> and then I started paying all that rent and I'm like, okay, I don't want this lifestyle no more. Child. It's, cute. it's not cute no more. <laughs> it was you get cute nothing. Exactly. You get nothing. You're paying all of this rent. And like, I mean, you helping your landlord pay their mortgage. It was not. That's what I'm saying. It's like, you might get a pool. Being here in Atlanta, it's like, you're going to get a pool, you know, maybe some security. But okay. other things, it's like, it's not really an investment, something that is going to show any return. And mm-hmm. number one, from my space up on Airbnb initially, I'm like, all right, I know that I can make some really, really good money here. And at the very least, if I'm not able to pocket any money, I am able to put that toward my living costs to where it's like, now I'm living for free. And that was my initial goal. My initial goal wasn't to like, okay, well, I want to make $10,000 this month and do this. My initial goal was just, I do not want to pay my mortgage. Yeah. How can I get to that point? Yeah. And that was it. And anything thereafter, it was it was just fair game. It was more so excess. So it was a, additional. And I think that's one of the primary things that really changed my mindset and made me move so quickly is realizing that, hey, if I could get rid of my living expense, which is literally the largest expense we have per month, it's the most you're ever going to pay in your lifetime. If I can get rid of that, I now have the flexibility because mind you, I still had my full-time job and I had my business on the side. I was making really good money. I'm like, all right, I can put all of this money I got into something else that is going to make me even more money. So that's where I was at with it. So smart. So smart. So we talked about the start of the process. When did you really know that this thing can work for me for real? When did I know... Airbnb could work for me for real. Um, I would say I knew Airbnb could work for me for real, like right after the weekend of the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, because honestly, like, and again, you have to understand that my initial goal when I was doing Airbnb, um, initially I started within short-term rentals, it was just to cover my living expense. Mm-hmm. So I knew that it was working for me when I'm like, all right, I just made my rent. In like the last 10 days, this still 20 more days in the month. Yeah. How much more can I make? Right. So that's when I really started to realize like, okay, this is, it's working for me. It's something that I can do. And then on top of that, again, understanding that the initial goal was not to scale and create all these units and go off and do this. The initial goal was just cover my rent. 
So once I did that, or once I was able to do that, it's like, all right, I'm not looking to go and get another unit and add some more stress and add more work. Like my one was fine. That's when it gets to a point of like, you kind of, you're, you're teetering with yourself of, okay, can I do this or not? When you have too much like workload, like there's too many units, there's too much to handle. You might not have a team at the start. I didn't need a team. Like it was my, it was, it was my, it was my house. Mind you, I didn't have to worry about where I was going to go in order to live because I was traveling for work Monday through Thursday at the time. So that made it super easy. I'm in a hotel for my work or my job during the week. And then I'm just flying to a friend's house, flying, flying to my parents' house. Like that's where I was. It was perfect. It was, it was honestly like the perfect storm. Mm-hmm. I, I have to be honest that it, it came together really, really well in the beginning. And then, of course, you know, as you start scaling and sometimes like I feel like we never really talk about this aspect of scaling too quickly, which is a mistake many of us make when you really start seeing all of that money. Scaling too quickly was really one of the pieces that started to, I guess, allowed me to see like, okay, maybe I need to start pumping the brakes and I really need to start figuring out how can I get. And this is going to turn into like, it's going to open up a whole nother can of worms, but how can I really like do the the internal work? Right. Because at that point I had proven to myself, it's like, okay, I can make some money. It's nothing to like, you know, make some money. But now it was, it was to a point where it's like, okay, I'm not enjoying my money. I'm stressing myself out. I have anxiety. I got this, I got that. How do you manage that? And that is the piece that allowed me to really like see that, okay, it's time for me to pump the brakes. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Can we dig a little bit deeper into that? Because I feel like it's very easy for us to talk about the numbers and talk about the money. But earlier you said something that was really important to me and that I love. You said long money. And I feel mm-hmm. like for anything to be sustainable, you have to do the internal work. Mm-hmm. So tell me what did that look like? Like, did an event happen? Did something happen when you're like, okay, I got to take a step back. I got to chill out for a little minute for the benefit of myself and for the benefit of my business. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I will say there was like a, a traumatic event. Like it, it was, I will be honest with you. There were a series of traumatic events mm-hmm. that led to me like, all right, I need to get my internal in order because you can have the external, right? Like I said, you can have the money, your external world could be going amazing, but if you're not good on the inside, it's not going to sustain itself. And that's exactly what was happening. So 2020, you already know, like I told you, I had closed on the house October, 2019. Um, And then quickly after like 2020 hits. And of course we all know what 2020 came, but it came with a whole lot, but that happened very quickly. Yeah. And then even furthermore, for instance, after that happened, right? Like I'm now out. I'm, I wasn't out of work. I was just working from home. So I'm back in my house, but now I got to pay the mortgage because they're not letting anybody rent. So wow. Airbnb had cut all of that off and I'm sitting in there and I'm trying to figure out like, okay, what can I do next? And that's when the idea for the tiny house came in. So there was still some good that came from all of that. But during the year of 2020, I caught COVID, I think at least two times at least two times, if not three. Um, My grandfather had ended up passing. There was a ton going on in terms of me actually getting started and getting going with, I guess, building the tiny house. I had gone through, if anybody has watched um, my Going Tiny docuseries on YouTube, I had gone through like three different sets of contractors because I was getting scammed. I was getting ripped off. Men were just not playing fair. And me being, again, at the time, I'm 22. Like, I don't know what's going on. I don't have any family here. I'm just kind of rolling with the punches. Yeah. And it was a whole lot, a whole lot, a whole lot going on. So it was really those series or that series of traumatic events of even thereafter. It's like I had gotten involved in, I, I call it a situationship, some kind of a relationship. And then that turned into something that was like physically abusive, verbally abusive as well. And me still trying to handle all of that on top of still running the Airbnb business, on top of still showing up in my full-time career, and on top of still serving my own clients that I had now brought on. There was so much. There was so much. And it was actually this, I would say, this enlightening piece that then led me to, it was that enlightenment that I received from all of those situations that then led me to be like, all right, let me pump the brakes. Let me slow down. Let me take a step back and then let 
let me really realize like, what am I doing all of this for anyway? That's one of the major questions I had because I've always been somebody who was like, I'm moving, right? Like I graduated high school in three years. I immediately went to college and then I'm graduating that early. Then I graduated with my master's early and we're on, we're in this rush yeah. so quickly for what? Right. Like, what am I working towards? Why am I even doing all of this? And then even furthermore, it's like, at some point, like when I had my, like, for instance, the peak of me doing short-term rentals, I had eight units at the time spread across Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Even there came a point where so much stuff was hitting the fan with that, where I'm like, why am I even like, why am I putting myself under all of this pressure? Right. Like, and I started to realize it was because I was still in that survival mode. Like I told you, like I'm I'm from Chicago. I'm first generation, everything. I didn't grow up with a lot of money, a lot of anything. So it was the fact that I was trying to chase or I guess run away from, okay, I I never want to be broke again. I can never be broke again. I I can't never go back. That was my mindset. Like I can never go back. But in the midst of me, like doing that, I realized like, okay, number one, I'm in survival mode. And number two, I am so far away from, I don't even want to say I'm so far away from broke, but it's like, you don't realize how far you've come because you're so fixated on the fact that it's like, okay, I can never go back there again. That when I really sat down with myself, I realized like, precious, you have money in stocks, you have a retirement account, you have this, you have that, like, you're okay. That's right. literally what I had to sit and tell myself. It's like, you're okay. Nobody is about to go back to the hood of Chicago again and live with your mom. You won't have to do that. And I swear to you, there were times I used to be in college early within my career. I used to say, it's like, oh my goodness, I got a lot of anxiety. I feel like one thing is going to go wrong and then I'm going to have to move back in with my mama. I'm going to be back in Chicago and everything is just, no, mm-hmm. no, no, no. And for me, like I had to realize last year, early last year, after kind of the series of all of the traumatic events that had happened, that's when I was then diagnosed with anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Um, And that's when I then realized like a lot of that was just my anxiety talking. It was just this piece of me thinking like, I have to remain in survival mode and I'm no longer just surviving. That's why I was overwhelming myself with so much work and moving so quickly and scaling so quickly. I don't, I don't have to work to survive anymore. It's like, okay, what can I do right now to really enjoy the space and the success that I've experienced? And that's the point that I'm at in my life right now is like, I'm done continuously working for the next thing. It's like, why am I doing all of this? Why am I putting myself under this pressure when I can choose whether or not I'm doing this or not? I can choose how much work I am doing because I'm, I no longer have a job telling me what to do. I choose what to do. Like it was baffling to me when I realized I'm choosing what to do every day. And every single day I'm still anxious and worried. It made no sense. Yeah. It made no sense. Thank you so much for sharing that. Like, I just really appreciate your transparency and your honesty. And I'm pretty sure there's somebody listening right now who can identify with that. Even me. Like always rushing to get to the next thing and something key that you said is why? Why rushing are you, why? What why, why are you rushing? Why do you want to do all of that? It takes a very self-aware person to sit down with themselves, look in the mirror and say, this is why I'm doing this. Because it can be masked as success, yep. but really it's, oh no, I'm in survival mode. I don't want to be broke again. You trying to prove something to either You're yourself, to prove something to somebody in your past, when there's somebody. nothing to prove. Nothing, nothing. I will never forget. I graduated college in 2020, mm-hmm. and I had applied for all these management consulting jobs. Girl was getting denied left and right. And I'm like, do these people not know who I am? Like, what's going on? Yeah. So I'm just getting denied. And I'm like, okay. So Kiani, what are you going to do next? In the meantime, you know, it was COVID. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back home because I'm not going to stay up here and struggle by choice. Mm -hmm. I moved back home. I had already applied for this master's program, got accepted. They gave me this scholarship, blah, blah, blah. But I had to sit down with myself and I'm like, Kiani, why are you going to grad school again? What, like, what are you getting out of? What's the purpose? Like, you know that you're good at school. You know you're going to go there and excel. You're probably going to graduate with a 4.0. It's going to feed your ego. Yeah. But really, why? Why are you doing this? 
So when you actually sit down and get real with yourself and ask yourself those hard questions, I promise you, you will start looking at a whole lot of stuff different. Yeah, because you you don't realize like I and even I would say like the theme of everything this year for me has been it's like I'm, I'm wanting to do less and be more. What I am and who I am is not tied to how much I can do in the amount of work that I produce. Right. I can just be who I am and I've already proved myself that, okay, I can make some money. Okay. I can make an impact. I can do this. I can do that. So then what, what's the point of continuously doing and doing and doing and keeping up on this hamster wheel just to wake up the next morning and you still feel the same way you felt yesterday of like, all right, I'm still anxious. I still don't know what to do. I still feel like I'm not enough or I don't have enough. Like, no, how can I really fixate on making what I have? Like last piece I'll say on this. Come on. I really said, (laughs) I really said, and I'm like, at one point I had prayed Mm -hmm. and I had, manifested and I journaled and I did all of this to get to the point that I was at then Mm -hmm. and then I got to the point and it's like why is this not good enough for me why am I continuously creating new problems and new goals and new things to work after when I just I literally had just prayed to get to this point two months ago now I'm here and the moment I got there I'm already fixated on the next thing I have not sat in this I haven't celebrated the success of this I haven't reflected on it or anything I'm just moving on to the next thing and that's when I really realized it's like no because I don't like there are so many times that people come up to me and they start rattling off all of my accolades and I can't I just sit there and I'm smiling like wow I didn't even know who is that I didn't who who's doing all that because you don't sit and you don't like we we tend to not sit in our success a lot it's yeah. like okay I got what I wanted what's next mm-hmm. no nothing's next let me sit in this for a little bit right, right. Enjoy it. so question is that something that you're still dealing with currently or do you feel like you have freed yourself from like you know wanting that next thing it's a constant journey for me. I have to be 100% honest. It's a constant journey. Like I have yet to master it. And a lot of people know, like if you have been following me, my personal brand and all that, like I've been doing a lot of reflecting. I journal, I've been journaling consistently for 10 years. And this has been something that I've been attempting to, I guess, get past and heal, but healing is constant. It is a continuous journey. So no, it's not something that I've gotten past. Like even earlier this morning, I'm like, oh, do I need to create some content? Let me release this. Let me release that. It's like, yeah. Mother's Day was yesterday, chill out. People are good. If you don't post anything, they'll be all right. Right. And that's something that is like every day, it's a constant reinforcement that I have to give myself because as somebody who is like, I like to consider myself very type A. I'm constantly thinking of new business ideas. If somebody say something to me and explain, and I'm like, well, you know, you can do this and make some money, right? Yeah. I, and it, that my mind just goes there. But yeah. I have to really like step back like, no, yeah. no. And it no. takes effort to even turn it off. Girl, I can be in the bed wanting to go to sleep, but can't like turn my brain off. So trust and believe, I understand exactly where you're coming from. But I want everybody listening right now to really listen and get into their heads like it can be a blessing and a curse absolutely like I want everybody to know like as long as you are walking in purpose you are serving other people you are showing up consistently with excellence everything Mm -hmm. will work itself out literally and I'm preaching to myself too like we don't have to rush to do xyz we don't have to chase xyz like we can be people like earlier you said who do I need to become we can just simply be and I'm not saying be lazy and not do nothing, but be be who you are and focus on your own development. And I swear to you, everything else will come. Like I like to think about things in terms of more of like an internal world and an external world. When yeah. you focus on the internal and you focus on healing yourself, you focus on developing yourself and becoming who you need to be to get what you want. That is when you're going to get everything that you want. But it's like, we want all of this stuff, but you get to ask yourself, how have I become the person that's ready to handle all of this? You yeah. want all of these units, you want all of this money, you want your bank account to be going crazy, but it's like, 
Are you the person, are you right now a person who can handle that? Have you become that person yet? And if you haven't, then that just means you need to go back to the drawing board. There's a reason that you have not gotten what you want just yet. And a lot of it is like, you got to focus on what you can control. And the only thing you can 100% control is you. Period. Ah! <laughs> ah, I hope you take notes. <laughs> That's all I got to say. I hope you take notes. So let's make a transition, Precious, because you shared some dope news on Instagram a couple of days ago. And I was so, so, so excited for you. I'm like, ah, look at her. <laughs> so you got this vision for tiny homes and you just started doing your own work not really I I would say not really comparing yourself to other people or not really doing it as a thing but it was something that you wanted to do and then someone reached out to you so can you talk to my community about your tiny home journey and now what are you hoping for it to become I am bringing back the Patreon Inside of the Patreon, we are doing a book club that starts on July 1st. And I'll put the name of the book, the title of the book, the link to the book in the description box. But in the Patreon, this is going to be an exclusive community where we are just going to help each other out on our journey, right? Our personal finance, our entrepreneurship journey. And all of my close home girls, close home boys who actually come inside of the Patreon, just know that I have something very special cooking up for y'all. So if you want to be a part of the book club, the only way that you can um, join is inside of the Patreon. So click the link in the description box to join the Patreon. And like I said, book club is starting on July 1st. July 1st. Also, inside the Patreon, you'll get access to the Think Like a Mobile podcast episodes first. So before they come out on a Tuesday, I'll say you will probably get access to it like days before. So maybe a Friday, maybe a Saturday, maybe even on a Thursday. I haven't really figured out the schedule yet, but you will get access to it before the general population. And we'll be talking about different podcast episodes, like having the after show. You'll be able to ask me questions that I can give back to my guests and they can answer them for you. So this is really just a community to dig deeper and to really make the change and see the change that we want to see in our personal and our professional lives. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad you asked. Um, Yes, so my tiny house. Number one, I love my tiny house. So for those who do not know, um, I designed, built, and pretty much started renting out my tiny house. Um, We started the build in 2020, finished up in 2021, and the home officially went live on the market March of 2021. So it's officially been a year. um, And I've already talked a little bit about just what got me started within thinking about the tiny home. I mean, I was just in the house during the pandemic, and I'm like, I got a lot of space in this backyard. And I intentionally chose an investment property with a lot of space in the backyard because I'm like I don't know what I'm gonna do yet but I'm gonna do something whether it's a pool whether it's another house guess how something so I intentionality come on come <laughs> on. you got you know I plan everything yeah everything. I plan it all so I had planned that so we finished the tiny house build and honestly it's been going amazing the build process in itself um the only word that I can use for it is just ghetto it was just so ghetto oh my goodness but um I learned a lot I learned a lot um when the build started I was 22 at the time um and now that it's been a full dang it's coming up on four years it's been four years it's like okay like we're getting there so um tiny home tours came and did a episode um in my tiny house it is yet to be released um so it's probably going to be a couple of more months until it's released but they came last week and did a tiny home tour of my structure and honestly it was absolutely amazing number one just being able to walk into anything right whether it's a tiny house a regular house whatever you want to call it something that you designed and you built like all of the measurements like I chose where the bathroom was going to go. I chose where the bedroom was, how big the loft, how much clearance. Just being able to walk into that structure is like, it's unreal. I have to be honest with you. It's like, it's unreal unreal to have something that was just like, it started in your head and it's the physical manifestation right in front of you. Um, Absolutely insane. So... Since doing that, um, I will say that I've began um, creating like a name for myself in the tiny house industry. Uh, so it's been good. <laughs> you know, you got to a brand. Um, so it's been really good. Um, the docu series is really, I would say, what helped carry that 
the most um, in terms of, again, documenting my process. And if you take anything else or you take nothing else from everything that I've said today, start documenting your process, whether it's journaling, whether it's you doing your own video blogs, whatever it is, you don't even have to release the stuff, but start documenting the process because you're going to be so surprised on what you're able to look back to, look back at, and then the growth that you experience yourself. Um, so actually documenting that process was the best thing that I could have done. So I dropped that on YouTube. Um, it's at about a quarter million views and it's a three part docuseries, um, did amazing. And that's what actually, I would say really picked up building the Airbnb money platform too, to what it is now, because a lot of people initially they had come from YouTube. So that was really good. And now since completing my own tiny house, I started to realize that for the most part, I am my own case study, because if you realize the, the housing market that we're in right now, the market is absolutely insane. And it's not really a good time um, for people who are looking to buy their first home. And then on top of that, we're like, we're going through a housing shortage right now. Yeah. So even when you look at here in Atlanta, it's like houses are not necessarily staying on the market. And those ones that are on the market, the prices are insane. Right now, the average price of a home is upwards of $300,000. Who has that for their first? I mean, I'm sure some people have it, but who wants to spend that as their first property, especially some people, again, millennials right now, who are just now starting yeah. exactly, to build their families and to get into that aspect of, okay, I think I want to buy a home. Right now, all of that is really being taken up by a lot of investment companies as well. So again, we are in a shortage. And that's why you see anytime you come to Atlanta, it's like there's, there's cranes everywhere downtown. They're building up because we are running out of room. So with everything um, and with everybody running out of room, it's like, what can we do to really capitalize on the space that we have now? We're here in the South. I'm not used to it being from Chicago, but here in the South, a lot of people have a lot of backyard space to work with. You have a single family home that's sitting on at least a quarter to a half an acre. What are you doing with all of that extra room? And for a lot of people, it's nothing. Right. So what I've done with my tiny home um, and what I've done with my investment property is something that we're now going to be cascading across, at least to start with the city of Atlanta. In terms of showing people, how can you really begin building up your own wealth and creating additional opportunity for other people by placing an accessory dwelling unit or some kind of structure in the back of your property? And even if you're not placing a structure back there, how are we able to leverage that land that you have to then integrate these communities of conventional and unconventional living? Mm, I love that so much. And I feel like you are going, well, I already know, you're going to be very successful because you are tackling a problem that is so clear in front of our face right now. Like, so, mm -hmm. so, so as far as, right. <laughs> as far as, um, like your vision for the tiny homes, do you ever see yourself like, because I've also seen like tiny home communities mm -hmm. and different things. What's your vision for your tiny homes? Um, my vision is number one, to just make them more accessible to like the everyday person. Because right now, uh, if you look it up, right now, most of the zoning, especially here within like the city of Atlanta, Fulton County, it's a lot of what they call exclusionary zoning. Exclusionary zoning pretty much means it's like, all right, I might have a single family home. I'm sitting on about a half an acre, but it's exclusionary in terms of nobody can come on my acre and do whatever they will. It's also a matter of even when you look at these people who have these unconventional structures, whether it's a tiny home on wheels, mobile home, whatever it is, it just excludes all of these other people and it makes it to where we are not really capitalizing on the space that we have. Okay. So my vision for the tiny homes is to just like turn this into a turn Atlanta at least into more of an inclusionary zoning type of area, if that makes sense. It's an area where people who, for instance, if you do have a structure, whether it's a tiny home, whether it's a tiny home on wheels, you're able to come to Atlanta and it's not like, for instance, the people who recorded um, my episode for tiny home tours, they themselves live out of an RV and they record and all of that. But when they came to Atlanta to record me, their hardest, the hardest challenge that they had was figuring out where to park. Wow. Like, where can I put the structure? Like, and if they put it anywhere, it's like, they got to make sure it's like, okay, it's probably not supposed to be here. Let me keep an eye out for the cops, keep an eye out for tickets. And it's just, again, it's not inclusionary for everyone. Because if I'm somebody, let's say, for instance, 
I have the room in my backyard. I have the room to fit another tiny house in my backyard. Will I do it? Probably. But, <laughs> but I have the room to fit another one. It would have been amazing if I, as a homeowner who all of this is in my, my, my name, I own the house and I own the land. It would be amazing if I, as a homeowner, could just say, hey, you could rent, you know, the piece of my land back there on a nightly price, let's say, of like $100 a night. Maybe it's even cheaper than that, right? But it would be amazing if I could do that and I could leverage my assets in order to make me more money and then even furthermore, bring more people in to where it actually, it creates a better experience for the overall city of Atlanta. Yeah. So that's my vision with everything is to just make it to where it's like, we're actually, number one, creating like, housing supply for mm -hmm. these audiences like aging people seniors who are aging out of their homes it's like a lot of them tend to downsize you can downsize into a tiny home and now your in-home care is maybe renting your house or somebody else is renting your house we even think about students i read an article that read like since 2020 a lot of students because housing prices are increasing a lot of them are living out of their cars because they just cannot afford to live on campus or to even live anywhere near their campus, be, especially if it's located in the metro city. So all of these are real issues that it's like, I want to be able to, I guess, create that supply for those types of people that really need it. That's where I'm looking to go with the tiny house community. I love that so much. As far as like price point, are tiny homes affordable? You can make tiny homes affordable. I think that's the, the piece that so many people love about it is like, you can build your own tiny home, for instance, and I built mine. So when I built mine all in, including all of the mistakes that were made and everything, we spent about $34,000. So I've seen people who built tiny homes for like $15,000. It really depends on how you are going to get started. And that is where your research comes in. I decided to get started with a prefabricated shed. So out the gate, just to get the structure, not even to make it look cute, to do the connections and all of that, just the structure in itself was about nine to $10,000. So for some people, if you're wanting to get started, let's say with an RV, with a container home, whatever it is, those options are a lot cheaper and they allow you that affordability that you are looking for. But I would say like as of now, especially since the start of when I had decided to build my tiny house, um, tiny homes are becoming less and less affordable. I will say, and it's unfortunate to say, but it, it's just, it's speaking to the market that we're in. Like yeah. everybody is flocking to this industry right now. And there's a lot of growth that um, the industry is expected to see within the next couple of years, which is why you see so many, you know, your boxables coming up and all of these different companies that are offering you the option to just, hey, buy the structure, put it wherever you want to. Right. And it's becoming so popular. Like a few years ago, who even knew what a tiny home was? Like. They were talked about, but they really wasn't making no noise like that, like that. For mm -hmm. So one more question before we transition into our soul food section. Mm -hmm. So I know we talk about on IG a lot how the Airbnb market has changed so much within these past two years. Mm -hmm. But for anybody listening, they still may want to get their feet wet. They still want to start Airbnb. Can you give us like a quick short synopsis on how somebody can get started if they have like little capital, medium capital, like, can you give us a little bit of insight? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So I always say that the best way to get started or the number one thing everybody should do, no matter how you are looking to get started is actually get a business structure. Um, don't run this like a side hustle. Don't just be taking cash outs, running money through your cash out. No, actually go and get a business. So the number one thing where I would say the first two things you want to do get your business and start building business credit. It just creates a sense of credibility for these apartment complexes that you might be speaking to and even furthermore, these private owners or these landlords, whomever it is. So get your business, um, whether that is an LLC, S Corp, whatever you want to call it, um, talk to a, a professional about that, but get your business structure with your secretary of state, get your EIN, which is pretty much like your social security number, but for your business. Think about it like that. And then your DUNS number. Your DUNS number is the number that is going to track most, if not all, of your business's financial history and its credit history. And then from that point, after you have those three things, you are then able to get started with building business credit and signing up for what's called vendor accounts, net 30 accounts, um, trade line accounts. People call them a number of different things. They're all the same thing. 
It's just an account on a specific website and they're giving you a certain amount of credit to spend and you can pay it back later. Typically right. that term is 30 days, which is why we like to hear, we typically hear net 30 accounts. Um, so that is usually how you're wanting to at least get started with the foundation, that business foundation. From that point, you want to get started calling around. You want to also make sure that as you are driving, you are keeping a lookout of any like for rent signs of any apartment complexes that might have some vacancies. That is usually how I start doing it is I create a hit list, whether it's of an area or even furthermore, it's like my hit list can also include, hey, here's an area that I want to be in. And here are all of the apartment complexes that have the parameters I'm looking for in terms of open parking, there's no security, whatever you want to call it. But start calling around and creating some kind of spreadsheet of like, do they accept corporate leasing? Yes or no. And if you're more so going the route of speaking with a private owner or like a landlord, that's going to look a little differently, but you still want to pitch your business in a similar way of, hey, I have these clients because usually they are clients. I want you to understand, number one, you are not just building an Airbnb business like Airbnb is just one marketing platform. It's yeah. just one of many, many, many different platforms you can be on in order to push your business. You can be on none of them and just have direct booking, but you still have a short term rental business. It is not just an Airbnb business. So when you are pitching to these places, this is why people typically say you don't even want to mention Airbnb. Now, for some people, all they want to be on is Airbnb. And if that's the case, then you should probably be completely transparent, transparent in what you want to do. And with all of the local laws and regulations that are popping up, your best route is probably going to be working with some type of homeowner or like a private apartment complex, similar to what I did when I got my corporate leases. That's going to be your best bet if you are not wanting to, you know, do any of that and even furthermore have your business credit pooled. However, if you are looking to go that route, again, you just want to get started calling asking them whether or not they accept corporate leasing, asking them if there are any restrictions. And then at that point, you need to go and tour and figure out whether or not this is something that can actually work for your business model. Um, and even furthermore, when you're getting started, I would also say make sure before you put any ink to paper, any sign, anything, make sure you understand who your actual target or like your niche is going to be. Don't get into a unit and then it's like, all right, let me think about it. You should already have that in your head so that you can determine, okay, how profitable is this really going to be? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Y'all rewind it, re-listen, take your notes, do anything because you gave a whole lot of gems right now. And I know for a fact, there's more to that. And we'll talk later on about like how they can connect with you, how they can invest in your courses, your eBooks, all of that stuff, because I'm the type of person, I just feel like if I can pay for somebody else's mistakes, sign me up. If I don't have to make all the same mistakes, fall flat on my face, do all of the things that you had to do. Oh, I'm definitely willing to open my wallet for that. You save, you save a lot of money in the process. Like a lot of times we feel like you're like, you're saving a coin by doing it yourself. But like, you, you don't, you never realize until after the fact how expensive it is to try to cut costs. Exactly. Like I realized that number one with my tiny house, initially my budget was like $25,000. And because initially I was trying to cut costs and okay, I'll go with this contractor over this contractor. Like I can't in the end, I came out spending way more than what I had. I would have initially paid if I had just done it right in the first place. Right. No shortcuts allowed y'all. No shortcuts. So now let's transition transition into our soul food section. So this is just like our fast round. Everybody mm -hmm. listening, you may or may not know I'm from King Street, South Carolina, which is a very small country town. Mm -hmm. And I love soul food. So <laughs> perfect. I'm going to ask you some questions. And I just want you to tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. So we live in an age where, you know, people want things very fast, very instant, very microwavable. Can you give me a time where something had to slow cook in the crock pot for you? Mm, the time something had to slow cook in the crock pot for me. I would say when I think about um, just my 
like the the community I've been able to build on social media, my social media presence, that is something that has been slow cooking for years. Um, so I started initially posting, like for instance, my YouTube, my YouTube had, did not pop off until last year when I put up all of the stuff in regards to the tiny house. Only then were people able to see all of the videos that I did five years ago, six years ago, over how do you get started online? How do you start monetizing your brand? What is infopreneurship? So that's something that definitely like seeing it now it's slow cooked to where because I was putting in all of that work and I was, I was making those deposits and just because they weren't getting the likes and the views that I wanted at the time I left it up there and now it's getting the attention it deserves period y'all show up consistently because you don't know when it's gonna pop yeah. so our next question the itis you know after you eat some real good food you just want to lay on the chair you tired Tell me, what is something that you're sick and tired of seeing in regards to either money or business? Mm. Something I'm sick and tired of seeing is people getting scammed for courses and buying courses online. And then you get into it and you're like, oh my God, this is so trash. It has nothing of what I needed. I spent my last dime on this. Yeah. You, what, what is that Bible verse? You, you, you know, the the fruit by you know the character by the fruit that it bears yep mm-hmm. that yeah you're going to know whether or not that course or whatever is going to be for you and is going to provide you with all of the information you need based on the fruit that you're seeing from the person that has the course yep. how accessible are they right now before you put a dime into their pocket are they able to answer your questions? Like, I'm sick and tired of seeing people say that they got scammed on something. And then I go to the course creators page and I'm like, why would you buy that? <laughs> they, they don't have anything related to their experience with doing it. It's just nothing but cars and purses. And you bought that. Exactly. Because <laughs> you want the lifestyle, like this, I, I, I can't say that I hate lifestyle marketing, but it's like, no, show me what it is that you're actually teaching but I'm happy you brought that up because that kind of ties into personal responsibility people need to start taking responsibility for their investments and you need to actually take more time and do research yeah people don't do enough research I have to say don't okay our next question the go-to so you know you have your go-to meal whenever you go to it and never disappoint it always hits so tell me your go-to. What keeps you inspired and motivated to be the businesswoman that you are? Mm, my go-to? What keeps me inspired and motivated? Yes, ma'am. Mm, I would say my past self, always. The inner child in me. Um, like I said, I've always done a lot of writing. I've been writing since I was a kid and consistently now in my adult life for about 10 years. And I constantly go back to like my journal entries. I constantly go back to videos I made previously and just looking at who I was Mm -hmm. and who I was is what pushes me to like, okay, let me keep going and being better. Because when I think about like, for instance, like my 13 year old self, my 13 year old self, if she was to meet 26 year old me now, oh my goodness, she, she would fall out. Like, oh my God. She was all out. So that's what keeps me motivated and keep, keeps me going is just thinking about like my inner child and giving her everything that she needed when she did not have it back then. Yeah. Do you ever reflect back on like your inner self, your inner child and surprise yourself, shock yourself like by the woman you've become today? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Because like... Oh, there's been so much growth, so many, <laughs> and it's been so much to again unlearn as well. We talk about unlearning. It's like I didn't. There was there came a point in my life where it's like I didn't even realize some of the stuff that I did was toxic, or some of the ways I responded or communicated was toxic because it was just how I grew up and how my family functioned. Yeah, I thought that it was normal. So when I got to that point of realizing, like, wait, everybody don't do this. This isn't normal. It was a lot of unlearning and kind of just like really knocking down my ego of, okay, like you're not always right. So yeah, I always, I I always, I love inner child work. Yeah, absolutely. And more of us need to do it, to be honest. Honestly, yeah. You gotta be real enough, (laughs) emphasis on the real and honest enough to actually do it, you know, but I'm I'm gonna leave that alone. (laughs) I'm gonna leave that alone. They ain't ready for that one. 
they not because everybody want to put on this face they want to save face they don't want to get real but getting real with yourself is so freeing exactly. and you just what the, the moment you start to realize like everybody that you see they're just children in adult bodies like they're hurt children how we respond how we communicate yeah. all of that is the child within you the mm-hmm. more that you heal that child the better person you're going to become overall absolutely so our last and final question is mm, that's good so when you take a bite into some food that's real good you're like mm, that's good so can you close out this episode with some words of wisdom something to give to an inspiring or current entrepreneur Hmm. Something to give an inspiring or encouraging entrepreneur. Um. Goodness, and I'm trying to put it in a way that's gonna make you say, mm, "That's good." <laughs> <laughs> um. So, I think as entrepreneurs, like we already talked a little bit about, like this fast life, instant gratification thing, and it's easy within being in this age of social media to think about, like how fast we want to get to something. It's like a million dollars in six months, thousand followers in, in 10 days. Like there's all of these different metrics and measurements. But again, like we already said, you need to think about that. Why? But then even furthermore, I think the, the more, the, the harder or the more difficult thing to do as an entrepreneur is to really slow down. And I would encourage a lot of people who are either you're wanting to step into entrepreneurship or you are already here and you're feeling burnt out. Look up the the concept of slow living. Slow living, um, I would say, is kind of the originator before the soft life came. Like I, I, everybody talks about the soft life now. Yeah. Um, look up slow living and really try to, I guess, digest that because you are going to realize that, like, sometimes it's not just about okay, how much more can I do, but it's it's more of a matter of like how much better can I do what I'm already doing. And that is like, it was a really big wake up call for me of like, I don't need a new business idea, a new ebook to drop a new this, a new that. What has been working? And what do I need to be more consistent at? And what do I need to do better in that thing? Mm, That's good. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Thank you so much, Precious. Before we end, can you please tell my people how they can invest in themselves how they can partner with you because I don't want the conversation to end here I don't want people to listen to this and say "Mm, that's good but don't take no action absolutely so how we can you know keep moving forward so if you are ready to start learning more if you are ready to start applying a little bit of what we talked about already um on this podcast then you need to just follow me on instagram the yeah. Instagram, like, I'm not even going to tell you to, hey, go to my bio and sign up for the training and do this and do that. Just go to my Instagram and just digest all of the previous content. Yeah. Um, it's going to speak for itself and show you like, okay, number one, this is all of my experience of what I've done. And it's going to give you that first leg in terms of, all right, how do I go ahead and get started? Now, for somebody who's like, you know what, Precious, all that sound good, but I need to talk to you right now. Go to my, go to my Instagram, go to my bio and just reach out to me. You can always DM me. I respond to DMs. Um, You can always DM me or you can go just into my, into the link in my bio and sign up for the free training. Once you do that, you'll be on my email list and you'll receive all of the information in terms of signing up for my mentorship coaching program and what have you. By the time this episode releases, the 2022 version of the Airbnb money ebook should be released. Um, so at that point you are able to grab that it is bundled, um, not only with the ebook, but everybody who purchases the ebook will also get, um, access to a audio course, helping you to kind of dive in and get started with short-term rentals as well. Absolutely love it. And from this episode, y'all can tell she's not giving y'all no cut and dry cookie cutter, nothing, honey, you will leave and make your investment back plus more, but not only that. You will do some internal work. You will grow a successful and a sustainable business because a business can be successful, but is it sustainable? So exactly. thank you again, Precious. I learned so much from you. I am inspired by you and I just appreciate you for being on the podcast. Yes, no, thank you so much for reaching out. Like I'm a super excited for this to drop. I hope it helps a ton of people. And at the very least, it makes them think like, mm, that's good. Like, <laughs> <laughs> period. 
Thank y'all so much for tuning into another episode on the Responsible Homegirl podcast. And always remember, with exposure, execution, and consistency, there is absolutely nothing you can't do. See y'all next time. If you love the Responsible Homegirl podcast, there are plenty of ways to show your support. I have them also listed in the description box. One, leave us a rating or review. Two, email me a review of the podcast so that I can share on social media. Three, I have listed our PayPal where you can send whatever you feel led to send. Or four, by joining our Patreon, our exclusive community where we host book clubs and we talk about all things personal finance and entrepreneurship. Whatever you decide to do, just know that I am so grateful and I appreciate you for sharing the responsible homegirl with all your homegirls and all of your homeboys. Thank y'all so much.